Well, welcome everybody. Um, and thank you for helping us launch the Acadian Archives new exhibit, Evangeline, or Evangeline. I'd like to acknowledge the following people for their expertise with the exhibit. Anne Chamberlain, Sue Tardy, Carrie Watson Blaisdell, Steve Michaud, Eric Bouchard, and Robert, uh, or Rob, Nelensny. We're fortunate to have items lent to us by Ms. Françoise Paradis, who is here, Mr. Jerry Morin, and Father Jacques Lapointe. There are two parallel stories told in this exhibit. The poem written by American Henry Wadsworth Longfellow is about a young woman and her fiance separated in the first wave of forced exile of the French Catholics of Acadia and the real story of Acadians who underwent ethnic cleansing. Evangeline, a tale of Acadie, was an immediate success after it was first published in 1847. It is probably the most famous American poem of all times. Translated into more than 100 languages, it is still being taught in schools and universities throughout the world. Evangeline became a sensation and a brand name, a marketing icon and a tool for economic development. In Louisiana, the real Evangeline's name is Emeline Labiche, and her body lies under a oak tree in St. Martinville. And there is no one called Evangeline in Louisiana. Meanwhile, in Acadie of New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and Prince Edward Island, Acadians were struggling to build a life after having survived Le Grand Dérangement, or the Great Upheaval. Evangeline's fame brought interest to a land and people no one had ever heard of. Evangeline became the catalyst for an Acadian Renaissance targeting all aspects of Acadians' lives from education to politics, from agriculture to arts. Acadie has given birth to politicians, universities, research centers, writers, historians, artists, and it continues to tell its story of resilience and faith. In the gallery, you'll hear two versions of the song Evangeline, the traditional one that I think most of us grew up with, and another more modern one. And over here in this nook, you can watch a documentary called Evangeline's Quest, where Evangeline appears and she doesn't know who she is and where she actually belongs. It's very, very well done. Thank you for coming. Enjoy the exhibit and the reception. And I have to thank Michel Leroy for being such a gracious host. Enjoy, everybody. <laughs> Hi there. My name is Lise Pelletier. I'm director of the Acadian Archives, Archive Acadienne, at the University of Maine of Fort Kent. And we are in the art gallery of the Acadian Archives Center. Uh, this is where we have all types of exhibits and shows, either thematic, historic, or artistic. And right now we have an exhibit about Evangeline. Almost everybody has heard of Evangeline, uh, the very famous poem by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, published in 1847. Now, how does that relate to our area? Well, Evangeline was an Acadian who went through the Great Deportation, or Le Grand Dérangement, uh, which was a forced exile uh, of Acadians to what we would call hostile lands. So I'm going to backtrack a little bit and talk about Acadie and why Grand Prix is so important. Um, Acadie, the name comes from 1524 from an Italian explorer and it's uh, 
it indicated that the coastline, the entire coastline of the Atlantic, uh, from Georgia, let's say, to uh, Labrador, was called Acadia. In time, uh, that definition came to mean the lands in Massachusetts, way down Massachusetts, to Cape Breton Island. And that is where the French settled, um, and they called it Acadia. So um, the Acadians, as they became, as they came to call themselves, now that is very important because although they claimed French heritage, they knew they were a distinct people. And so calling themselves Acadians indicates the level of, of uh, distinctiveness and, and separateness uh, from their motherland. And in fact, it was completely different life. They had a good life. Um, they had managed to dry up the lands, the marshlands of the Atlantic Ocean, and reap the benefits of uh, the nutrients uh, soil that was gathered and so they increased their farmland by thousands and thousands tens of thousands of acres of land and uh, that land was extremely rich um, they did this through a system of uh, dikes and levees and uh, uh, sluices where the salt water would come in and drain out uh, washed out by the rain and in two three years that that land was arable and ready for cultivation. No rocks, uh, no stumps, and nothing to prevent growth. And uh, so they were quite independent. Um, they were farmers, not soldiers. And all they wanted to do was continue their peaceful existence and ensure their children's existence by transmitting land to them. And so that is what they hoped to continue. However, um, Acadia was a colony, and this colony had been shifted uh, to between Great Britain and France seven times in a hundred years. And now we're in 1730, um, and the, the British are uh, in authority, and they want Acadians to sign an own unconditional oath of allegiance to the crown. And Acadians, although they do want to uh, swear that they will not take up arms against the British, they also want to make sure that the English understand that they will not take up arms against the French or the Mi'kmaq, their allies as well. And in addition to that, one essential condition of their oath was that they would be able to practice freely their Catholic religion. Um, and so in 1730, they signed a, this conditional oath. Um, and later, it would come back to haunt them because Great Britain thought that they had signed an unconditional oath. Anyway, um, at the time that Acadians were enjoying what is called the Golden Age of Acadia, uh, the rate of immigration to Massachusetts and the New England states was, it was dramatically increased. And since, uh, since the newcomers wanted to go into the forests and cut down the trees to make land, but also to make houses and to develop their, their own um, places and new villages, um, the pace was not uh, keeping up uh, employment and food and housing um, and all the rest were just not keeping up with the flow of immigrants. And so uh, the governor of Massachusetts and the governor of um, Nova Scotia started uh, thinking about a way <clears throat> to replace the Catholic French of Acadia with good British subjects, as they were called, because at the root of, of what we will uh, come to know as ethnic cleansing uh, was a deep hatred of Catholics. Um, and it was also a strategic move, but uh, nevertheless. Um, so the, um, uh, the British started their plan in 1755 
Um, and since they did not have enough soldiers on hand to send vessels to get Acadians, they enlisted the help of uh, Yankee men farmers um, in other words, uh, they became mercenaries um, and they were paid by the British Crown to help carry out this, uh, what, uh, what they called a great and noble scheme. Uh, basically, it was the forced removal of Acadians from their lands, from their homes. Um, everything had been confiscated. Everything that they owned had been confiscated, uh, even their livestock and uh, their, their fields, their churches. Everything was destroyed. And one of the reasons everything was destroyed was so that Acadians who might come back could not have a deed and say, I own this property. So all those documents had been destroyed. Now the way the, um, the expulsion or uh, deportations, and that's a false word um, that we use because it was not deportation. Um, the way this plan was carried out where the women and men were already separated and let's say that there were 20 or 30 vessels waiting out into the sea. You think you're waiting on the shore to be accompanied onto a ship and you think because you're told you're being deported, you're going back to France or you might go to New France, which be, would be closer. But that wasn't the plan of the British. The plan was to separate individual families, but also separate communities. So those 30 vessels might have had 30 different destinations. Um, so if you're boarding a ship with your daughter and one of your neighbors, let's say, you don't know where you're going, but you don't know where any of the other ships um, is going either and so it becomes extremely problematic in the years to come in trying to find your family. That was a plan. The, the plan was to prevent Acadians from recreating their culture um, because they, they had such strong ties of community. The British feared that if they ever got together again, uh, they could become um, a menacing force. And so uh, this is the way the, deep, the um, expulsion, if you will, or exiled was carried out in all of the villages and it lasted for eight years. So the last ones occurred in 1763 um, and at that time France and England signed a treaty, the Treaty of Paris, and all the lands of uh, Acadia and New France were transmitted or given to Great Britain. And so there ended the uh, French rule in the New World and thereafter it was uh, Great Britain that ruled. So where does the poem Evangeline come into play? Um, the poem Evangeline is about an Acadian young woman who um, is engaged to Gabriel and they are separated by uh, the expulsions or the, the deportations, the forced exile. Um, and Evangeline goes off and tries to find Gabriel. And she does this over a period of 20 years and she goes through many, uh, many different um, uh, colonies and many different what we call uh, states today and she doesn't find Gabriel uh, finally after 20 years uh, she decides to devote her life uh, to the people who are sick and so she becomes a sister of mercy and works in a hospital and after a time she encounters this uh, dying man on a hospital bed and recognizes in him uh, the love of her life, Gabriel. Um, and as she bends down to kiss him, he dies. And so we have uh, the makings of a great literary work uh, written in a very romantic period. So we have all the elements that combine to uh, really 
become a, a, an attractive reading for everybody around the world. Uh, so we have a, a very young lady who's in love, first love, um, and it, it is the love of her life. Um, she remains faithful. She has always been seen as a good person. So you can see that she's uh, almost, um, she's seen as, you know, the perfect, uh, the perfect uh, person or, or woman. And um, the, uh, she is loyal to her fiance, although he is no longer around and cannot be found. But she also exhibits uh, love, and hope um, and faith. And so those elements uh, really carry her through the number of years that she travels and searches for Gabriel. And it strikes a resounding chord in everybody. In fact, uh, the poem was translated in over a hundred languages and it, it is still uh, very much a poem that is taught uh, at universities and in schools because, both because of the story and because of um, the exemplary way it was written. The problem <laughs> with Evangeline is at one point um, Acadians felt that she did not exhibit the real character and strength of Acadians. Uh, in the poem, she's often weeping and distressed, and although she carries on, uh, she is seen almost as submissive and as a victim, whereas uh, Acadians did not certainly feel that way. Uh, in fact, during the deportation, <clears throat> there were a group, there was a group of resistance fighters led by Joseph Boussoleil Broussard, his nickname was Boussoleil um, Broussard, and there are many Broussard descendants in Louisiana today. So this exhibit is made up of the poem, um, Evangeline, the story of the poem, uh, the real history of Acadians that you find that are researched and on the, the uh, walls as well, and then the dramatic effects of the poem uh, through uh, to Acadians in Louisiana and Acadians in the Maritime Provinces. So we're going to look at that today. So here in these black panels um, is the history of Acadians. It is, it is a very um, summarized version of the history because we're looking at 150 years uh, or 160 years, um, you know, in a couple of paragraphs. So um, it's very succinct. Uh, the importance of Grand Prix, for example, in, in this panel, Grand Prix, uh, because this is the area, the place or the town where the first deportations occurred. And if you go to Grand Prix today, Today, you will find a National Historic Park uh, created by the Government of Canada, um, which is quite beautiful. I encourage you to go see it. It is also the site of uh, the diking system that has been declared by UNESCO a World Heritage Site. Uh, those dikes were created 400 years ago and they are still in working order. Um, and they still maintain the lush fields, et cetera, et cetera. So that's quite an, an, an amazing feat. Um, this is Grand Prix, a little bit later on at the turn of the 20th century, where um, Evangeline was now a common name, a very famous poem, um, and someone from uh, John Frederick Herbin, who was a descendant of Acadians on the maternal side, decided that he was going to create um, a trail going to Grand Prix, and so there was a railroad 
and the, a church was built and so that church is in Grand Prix and it's on the National Historic Park. There's the famous statue of Evangeline in front of the church and all around it is where the National uh, Historic Site was built. So it, it is quite impressive. So you see that at the turn of the century, Evangeline is, is not just a poem but is being used as a marketing tool. Uh, which it will be even more important in the years to come. In this panel, we have two examples of resistance um, during the Acadian expulsion. As I mentioned earlier, the Acadian expulsion lasted eight years. Um, and no, Acadians did not all go meekly to the boats um, and pack their belongings. Of course, they weren't allowed to bring anything except what they were wearing. But there were uh, guerrilla fighters who banded together, uh, in particular uh, um, Joseph Beausoleil Broussard and his brother Alexandre. Together uh, they had seven sons who became their lieutenants. Now we're talking guerrilla. Um, these were mercenaries and so they fought the British. While the deportations were going on, um, some Acadians tried to escape and as they were escaping the British hunted them down. Uh, so it wasn't just a, it, it wasn't an, a clean operation if you will. This went on for more than seven years and while it was going on Acadians were trying to survive trying to stay away from the British, um, maybe hoping that things would, would stop, and um, trying to save their lives. Now, some decided to stay with the Mi'kmaq, their allies, but there was never enough, enough food and sustenance for a greater number of people within a Mi'kmaq village, for example. Um, so Broussard, but also this example here, and this ties us to the Madawaska territory. Uh, in 1755, a young girl by the name of Marianne Guilbeau was part of uh, 232 Acadian prisoners. They were boarded on a ship called the Pembroke. And this, uh, the Pembroke was bound for North Carolina in December of 1755. Well, the Acadians took over the boat. So they uh, commandeered the boat and they steered it to the mouth of the St. John River. Eventually, the Acadians would walk um, or make their way to the province of Quebec, which is not far uh, if you consider what the highway was, and that was the St. John River. Um, and then right here in the St. John Valley, there's the Madawaska River, and then there's uh, Timiskwata Lake, and then a portage, and then you're at the Seaway. So it was a very popular highway. It was the highway and it was well known. And so this group of Acadians made their way to Quebec and most of them unfortunately died of a contagious disease. It was either cholera or some other contagious disease. At one point Marianne Guilbeault who was uh, a young girl, seven or eight, when she was uh, boarded on the Pembroke, came back to the settlement of Saint Anne des Pays Bas, where Acadians had hoped to establish a permanent settlement after the deportation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So she came back and she married a seer, C Y R. Now. In 1785, she and her husband and their family would come to the Madawaska territory or the Upper St. John Valley area. Um, and so she was a survivor of uh, the deportation. She'd been made prisoner and the group had overturned the situation. She'd escaped to Quebec, um, made her way back to saint anne des pays bas which is close to Fredericton now, um, and then came to the Madawaska area. So we have a direct line uh, to the ethnic cleansing that went on and a survivor of the ethnic cleansing. 
Um, here we have an example of the effect of Evangeline or the effect of the poem um, on Acadians, Acadians in the maritime provinces. It's interesting that first of all there are still people like me um, and uh, like my interviewer Don and like many people of the St. John Valley uh, and the maritime provinces who call themselves Acadians but there is no land called Acadia anymore. That geographic entity no longer exists. Um, and it, this is just a, such a profound um, sense of belonging, you know, that a person would say, I'm Acadian, when there is no homeland that exists anymore. And, and so it has profound connotations on the um, elements of identity, for example, and one of which is a homeland, and now we say Acadia is actually where uh, the, the Francophone people of the maritime provinces exist, and Acadia is in the hearts of people, but it's a little bit less romantic than that because it can have political uh, connotations uh, as well as we will see. Um, here Evangeline takes on an almost mystical um, quality and in fact I have heard her referred to as a saint um, because people did not know, a lot of people still do not know that she never existed. She's a complete fabrication. In fact the name Evangeline is also a complete fabrication. It did not exist before the poem was created and published. Well, after the poem was translated in French and everyone knew or learned about this poem, everybody called their daughters Evangeline. And that's why the name has carried on, but it is a complete invention. It was never an Acadian name. But the name lives on today as a testimony to the strength um, and power of a, a poem. So Evangeline becomes, she's everywhere. She's a statue. She exists in um, uh, stained glass in churches. She's on stamps. Um, over here we see the national, the hymn of Evangeline that was taught in the St. John Valley um, about um, it, around uh, the turn of the century and everybody knows that song um, and the um, uh, a newspaper a daily newspaper in New Brunswick was eventually called Evangeline so what happened to the Acadians of the maritime provinces once the poem was written um, as I said the poem was almost immediately translated by Panfil Lemay and it was published in a serialized form in a newspaper and it was distributed to all the Acadians of the maritime provinces and the poem was read in French and so Acadians became aware of Evangeline existing so this was the first time now remember it it's not that long ago, 1847, it's not that long ago that Acadians came back from exile. They came back from exile in the 17, let's say 1780s, 1800. They are still trying to survive and they are still, as Antonin Maillet says, they are still keeping quiet so as not to awaken the sleeping bear. And here we have an explosion of interest coming from the outside world. The outside world um, manifested in the poem Evangeline. All of a sudden, people are talking about Acadians. They're talking about Acadia. They're talking about uh, the ethnic cleansing, although it wasn't called ethnic cleansing at, at the time. So there's a lot of attention focused on Acadia. And the effect on Acadians themselves is they decide they are going to recreate their people. They are going to organize 
and they are going to seek equal rights uh, for themselves. When Acadians came back from exile, they did not have the right to own land. They did not have the right to vote. And so, you know, schools in French, etc., these were all um, essential and very important issues that had to be dealt with. But before that could be done, Acadians had to become a people again. And this is the period of time that we call the Acadian Renaissance. Um, it's a renaissance because at the, at the heart of it are uh, conventions, national conventions. And the first one was in 1881. So this is where this is depicted. Um, and within a couple of years, Acadians have chosen a flag, the very prominent tricolor uh, French flag with a yellow star, the yellow star uh, being our uh, Ave Marie Stella, um, Our Lady of the Stars or Our Lady of Assumption. <coughs> um, and they have a national anthem, which is Ave Marie Stella. They have a national day of celebration, which is August 15th. And they talk about education, economics, agriculture, educating uh, the youth and all the elements of uh, political representation, for example. And so they start organizing and the elements that I mentioned, like the flag, the national anthem, these are symbols of a people. And so people unite under this, these symbols and at the same time they connect to each other uh, through their shared history and shared, um, shared familial links as well, but also in the interest of building a future together. And so these national conventions, which started in 1881, um, morphed into what we now know as uh, international Acadian Congresses, uh, which happen every five years. We celebrated one in 2014, this area being recognized um, as having Acadian people living in it. Um, and the next one is in Prince Edward Island and southeastern New Brunswick in 2019, so next summer. Um, the, this uh, panel shows how uh, popular the name Evangeline became and so she becomes a label, a label that is affixed everywhere and is, is carried uh, about. In the next panels, um, these are important because they demonstrate the bicentennial, the celebrations of the bicentennial of the deportation of Acadians. You may find it strange that we would, uh, people would celebrate uh, such a disastrous um, event to their culture, but actually what they were celebrating was uh, the survival of ethnic cleansing and uh, the demonstration that Acadians still existed um, and they were they were strong and so it was celebrated in the maritime provinces but it was also celebrated in Louisiana which is the second panel we see here so how did Acadians in Louisiana feel about Evangeline well when the poem was published quite a few uh, Louisiana Acadians were very insulted and they said Evangeline stole our history much like um, the history of Acadians of the St. John Valley is not taught in schools and not very well known. We know that history is written by the winners of wars and the authority and so much of history is lost um, because history books are biased unfortunately. Um, <clears throat> and so one gentleman in Louisiana decided that he was going to fix this situation. He was going to write 
the real story of Evangeline. And the real Evangeline's name was Emmeline Labiche. And yes, the, so the storyline is pretty much the same, except at the end of her story, she finds Louis, her fiance, in St. Martinville, Louisiana, and he's married. So he moves on, and she dies of a broken heart, and she is buried at the foot of a great oak tree in St. Martinville, Louisiana. So another fictitious heroine who people believe existed and whose bones we could find at the foot of a tree. So another fiction. Another important feature of uh, the uh, Louisiana Acadians taking hold of their own history uh, was also recognizing that Evangeline could actually publicize the Acadian slash Cajun um, connection and history. So before we go any further, I, I'd like to talk about Acadian. In Acadian French, um, the C and the, the, uh, the C is, is pronounced like de j, de j, like Dieu, like God is D-I-E-U. It's pronounced J, D-J-I-E-U, okay? So Acadian, in French Acadian, would be pronounced Acadien, Acadien. So when Louisiana Acadians were in Louisiana and they said, you know, somebody asked them, who are you? They'd say, je suis Acadien, je suis Acadien, and then it became I am a Cajun, Cajun, Cajun. So that's where the word comes from. And they truly are our cousins, uh, many times removed, but definitely of uh, the same uh, families that knew um, the deportations and the ethnic cleansing. And so they used the brand Evangeline extensively. Um, and their culture is known now as Cajun. And at the time they used Evangeline, you can see um, on the panels there how popular she was. She's in everything from um, the garage mechanics to the uh, soda bottles to yams, um, everything. And uh, she is also part of a big tourist industry because everybody who loves the poem wants to visit where Evangeline died. And so they flock to St. Martinville, Louisiana. And to this day, this still goes on. Um, in, of course, today, in the years uh, following the 20th century and the, the um, renaissance of the Acadian people in the maritime provinces and the Acadian people in Louisiana, of course now with technology and the great uh, Acadian congresses, we have come to meet our cousins and um, our uh, friends from Louisiana and it is really, really interesting to find how closely our words, for example, our phrases have survived uh, for centuries. Uh, we still use the same words that were taught to the Acadians by the Mi'kmaqs in Acadia. That is impressive. That is really, really impressive. Um, and there are many other ways that we resemble each other, although with time, of course, we all evolve in our different uh, geographic locations and we uh, have influences from the surrounding areas. And that happened in Louisiana as well. Um, but they have truly established a Cajun brand. Um, and that was a direct result of the poem of Evangeline. If we look at this panel, this is a panel of Evangeline in St. Martinville, Louisiana, or in general in Louisiana. This is the uh, gentleman who wrote the real story of Evangeline, 
of Emeline Labiche. His name was uh, Felix Voris. And the book is called Acadian Reminiscences, The True Story of Evangeline by Felix Voris. And I told you the story. And so it brings people to St. Martinville to see where the oak, where Evangeline is buried. And here you have three pictures of ladies dressed in what they assumed was uh, the clothing of Evangeline's time. And they're having contests to choose the representative, the true Evangeline here. So you can see how popular Evangeline is because these contests go on for a series of time. Um, right up here in the corner, this is the flag of the Acadiana, uh, the Louisiana Acadians. So we see that the three colors, uh, the blue, white, and red of the French are depicted. And this is a symbol of the French of uh, royalty. And of course, the star of Mary uh, still shows, but in a white section. So the configuration is a little bit different, but the elements are all there. And so this is uh, the flag of the Cajuns of Louisiana. These um, two posters are integrated into the exhibit about Evangeline because um, they depict uh, the real history of Acadians. Um, here we have the names of Acadians according to a 1750 census that was taken in Acadia before uh, the exiles started. And there are over 300 names. The names are also available on I the internet if you look for them. But it's, it's quite interesting to see how many of these names uh, actually exist in our area. Um, so we do have a very uh, deep connection to Acadia. This is a poster of, it's called the Odyssey. It's a famous poster. It depicts uh, the exiles, the forced removal and exile of Acadians from Nova Scotia to the different British colonies of the time, colonies that would become um, American states in not such a long time, right? In about 30 years or less so, uh, they would all become uh, American states. But what we have to remember is Acadians were French Catholics and they were, they were all shipped to Protestant English towns and colonies. And so those towns and colonies were very hostile to Acadians. And what followed was not a relocation of a people just moving to a new settlement. Uh, they, the Acadians were thrown into prisons. Um, they were mistreated. They were not allowed any freedom and they were not treated as prisoners of war. Acadians actually petitioned the different governments where they landed asking them or demanding to be treated as prisoners of war. That tells me that they had that knowledge um, and they were not shy about requesting uh, th their rights, but those rights were never granted. And so half the population of Acadians that were removed died. They died um, either in the ships uh, from malnutrition or mistreatment, and the same thing when they arrived in the uh, colonies. And so they remained in those colonies until the end of uh, the war with England, between England and France. And then they petitioned the British government to return to their homeland. Of course, when they returned to their homeland, their lands had already 
been given to British subjects. So the the bartering and uh, the um, uh, the sale of these lands started in s the late 1750s, and by 1760, there were, for example, a great number of New England planters already established in Grand Prix. So this section of the poster shows after the removal of Acadians, what happens after that? Well, a number of migrations and returns. So the returns, of course, is people walking up to Nova Scotia. And this is the story behind Antonin Maillet's book, Pelagie, The Return to Acadie. It's, a, it's an amazing book. Uh, it's beautifully written. And it's available in French and English. And it tells the true story of Acadians returning from exile to their homeland. You would think that they'd had enough. You would think that after uh, being so mistreated and after suffering ethnic cleansing and knowing that the British government, that Great Britain was now the owner of Acadia, they would have no intention of returning. But they did. Um, and they did return, and when they returned, they had to sign an oath of, uh, of allegiance to England, which they did, and uh, they settled only in those sections that were allowed to them. They couldn't settle more than 10 families at a time. Again, this was an attempt to prevent Acadians from recreating a community that was large enough to maybe pose a threat to the British. And, and whatever it was, um, it, it separated the Acadians who came back and wanted to settle together in one area. Um, that didn't seem like it was going to be possible. And so what happened is a lot of Acadians um, settled in the area of New Brunswick, which was close. New Brunswick was not yet a province, but it was going to become one soon. You also have a number of Acadians here who go from uh, prisons in England where they were shipped during the deportation years, coming back, going to France, and then coming back to the area, and some going directly to Louisiana. So nobody, none of the Acadians were deported to Louisiana. They went there on their own. In fact, uh, one of the most famous of Acadians is the resistance fighter Broussard. He uh, chartered a ship with about 1,500 Acadians, and they went to Haiti. And within a couple of months, uh, they decided they were not going to stay there. They were going to go on to Louisiana, where it was a Catholic uh, colony and where they were promised one year's sustenance. And so all but about 100 people uh, left for Louisiana. Those who stayed behind, those Acadians, married into the Haitian population. And today, you have Haitians who have the names Arsenault and Alain and Babin and in Haiti, and it's it's quite surprising, let me tell you, for our Haitian students here at UMFK who come here and see people walking around in town who have the same names as their neighbors, but they're not the same color, and so what happened there? Uh, so that's the story of Louisiana, and um, so there were a number of migrations going on as well. So we're looking at a century of upheaval, really. Uh, by the time Acadians come back and try to reestablish themselves, um, of course, under the authority of the British government, wherever they were, and they were not treated as equal citizens, um, they, they come back with nothing. Uh, they don't have, you know, they haven't amassed fortunes while they were in prison. And so they must start up again. At the same time, they're wary of making too much of a fuss 
or um, becoming a, um, um, a voice against the British authority because they don't want to go through uh, the same treatment again. But they set roots and uh, they become a people with the, uh, uh, the national conventions as a result of the publication of Evangeline. So it's quite interesting to understand um, the, the depth of effect, the profound effects that a fictional character has had on a real people. Um, so, so today Acadians are all over the world. Um, they number around four million and uh, every five years they get together for uh, an, an Acadian Congress that is international and I hope this continues. And in, in um, the Maritime Provinces there are uh, associations, there are two associations of Acadians. Uh, one that is more cultural and um, genealogically inclined and family reunions and as such. And the other one is really a political force um, where they examine what is going on with the French language, for example. And in fact, in 1960 in New Brunswick, they elected the first prime minister, the first premier of Acadian, Louis Robichaud, um, whose platform was equal justice for all. And so that meant um, schools would have to teach in French with French textbooks because those were not necessarily available to French-speaking people. Um, in a very few years, New Brunswick became officially bilingual, which means that wherever you go, you can have full services in either French and English um, if it is a government entity. Therefore, the hospitals, the courts, um, and everything related to uh, government, for, for example, uh, you have the right to be served in either English and French. And so that also uh, brought about the creation of francophone districts. And so the French language is still quite strong, uh, not on an equal footing as the English language still. Um, it is a fight, it is a struggle, much as we have to struggle in the St. John Valley. If it does not exist as a pure subject in the elementary schools, it's not validated and it will disappear. It, unfortunately, we will lose the French language in the St. John Valley if we do not act very soon. And so uh, we are at um, in the 21st century and although I feel that the Acadian identity is strong here in the St. John Valley, we might have difficulty in describing what that means. Um, basically, I think we are united by shared values. But one of the elements of identity that is um, foundational is language. Um, and our language is, is French. It's the language that we use when we talk to our babies. It's the first connection that we have to our children and this is the language we use to, to tell them we love them, but it's also the language that we use as a tool to transmit the traditional arts of our parents and grandparents and the values we hold dear. Uh, for example, our love of community, um, our belief in life, um, that brings about hope and it may sound religious but 
it doesn't necessarily have to be religious. Um, it is very much a part of who we are to believe in life and believe that things will get better. And that's why we help out. That's why we volunteer. We believe in community and we also believe in helping each other out uh, because we are akin to everybody. Uh, the thing that worries me most about uh, our people of the St. John Valley is the loss of the French language. It, it was demonstrated in studies in 1994 that we were losing our language at a rate uh, that had not been expected. So it was disappearing much more rapidly than anticipated. And unfortunately, since then, uh, the French language has almost completely disappeared from elementary, the elementary schools in the St. John Valley. And that is where French should be taught. Um, not at the high school level. You should not begin a language program at the high school level. Um, you're dealing with a different population of children or young adults who already have um, very uh, strong misgivings about, uh, you know, pronouncing in, in front of people. And it's, it has been demonstrated, and research has proven this, that when we learn a second language as a child, our intelligence actually grows. And to us, it's not only an international language, which French is, um, it's also the language of our, our people and our ancestors. And it's a language of business in the St. John Valley. And it's a language of, of uh, social activities. It's a language of education. It's a language of um, all kinds at all levels. So it acts like a, a very good uh, language. It's not used in one specific area. It's used everywhere. But more and more, it's used with the older generation. And so um, if we do not make efforts to bring the French language into the classroom, thereby showing that French is valid, and especially the French that we speak. Valley French, that we call Valley French, is called Breillon in Edmonston and called Joal in Quebec. And basically they are all the same. It's an oral language and that is what should be taught to our children so they can connect with their parents, with their neighbors, with their grandparents and become a useful language and also um, develop a pride in their, in their culture because the language is the foundation of that cultural pride. So we had a good start with the 2014 um, Congress in this area. People were f proud to display Acadian flags. I encourage everybody, bring out those flags, bring out those yellow stars, show people what you're proud of, who you are. It doesn't take anything away from being an American. You are also Acadian and be proud of that. Um, and so I'd like to end this visit on, on that note. Thank you.